So, um, thank you, Abdesim Garan, who's a research fellow from Durham University, uh, who's going to present a social, social anthropological perspective on uh, the redevelopment uh, of psilocybin uh, and uh, some of the conflicts that can occur uh, when we try to um, apply a, a medical model uh, to that. So, Hello. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, use this as well. Oh, that's for them. Okay. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so thanks, James, Tara, and Catherine, uh, and the team for uh, inviting me here. Um, I appreciated some of the themes around empowerment and uh, trust before lunch, and some of that will come up again in this talk. Uh, and there's a, uh, <coughs> maybe a disclaimer. Um, I am one of those academics whose job it is to critically engage other people's work. So uh, that's just a, a reference to a Alan's uh, point earlier in the day. Um, so I'll be uh, reading something I've written. Um, uh, okay. I've been, I've been asked to give a social anthropological perspective on the task of <clears throat> making psilocybin into a medicine. My own background includes postdoctoral research on the Johns Hopkins psilocybin assisted smoking cessation trial, uh, the pilot trial. From 2015 to 2013, I led a qualitative retrospective study conducting interviews with participants. And since then, I've been an ethnographer of the rise of psychedelic science and the psychedelics community more broadly. I've been based largely on the east coast of the US, so that is where most of my ethnographic sites are located. One way to approach the challenge of making psilocybin into a medicine is as an instance of what is called medicalization, the shaping of problems are specifically medical in nature in order that they can be studied, diagnosed, treated, and prevented as such. We might ask, why the, medicalization, why the medicalization of psilocybin now? As has been well documented, the pipeline for new and feasibly patentable psychotropic drugs is drying up, foretelling of a looming crisis in the pharmaceutical industry. Challenges to the claims that drugs are chemical fixes for chemical imbalances are gaining traction. For the industry, new commodifiable products are urgently needed. With the proliferation of psychometric, epidemiological and in vivo brain imaging data and respectable and reputable research teams, psychedelic science is poised to answer farmers' call, retooled, rebooted and suited for 21st century science. Medicalization has always been at the heart of the resurgence of the applied science of psychedelics. The justifications for needing research include claims to potential public health benefit, whether for addiction, palliative care, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, or social anxiety. Meanwhile, as the number of trial participants has grown and data on them amassed, Comparative studies are being published that reveal little or no difference between spontaneously occurring mystical, spiritual, or religious experiences reported online or gathered through large-scale surveys, and psychedelic experiences induced in the lab context. These kinds of comparative study are serving a double function, both normalizing psychedelic experiences while medicalizing all such experiences by bringing them into the jurisdiction of psychedelics research. As psychedelic science grows, it's also shaping broader discourses surrounding altered states. Over the past 10 years, the mystical experience has been increasingly modeled, quantified, and coveted as a mediating variable in the successful treatment of therapeutic targets. Referred to in overlapping ways, as an experience of ego dissolution or ego death, or as a peak experience, the mystical experience tends to be homogenized and charged with extraordinary power to produce lasting change in people. A resurgent perennialist philosophy has provided it discursive clothes, fetishizing it on the model of the cure that medicalization demands. Perennialism, uh, for those of you who aren't, don't know it, it is, 
in its sort of modern form is uh, as articulated by Aldous Huxley, that the mystical experience is the same experience kind of cross-culturally and across time. And, and, and on this, on the mystical experience, there's an interesting, I think, difference between the emphasis that tends to get laid on this kind of experience in the US and the UK research sites, and that could be something that to, to, to discuss later. I think in the UK there's more of an emphasis on, um, on well, uh, for example, Robin was talking earlier about kind of uh, emotional breakthrough, invent the emotional breakthroughs. Uh, this idea of the reset button comes up. There are different kind of tropes that can be used to describe that profound transformatory experience, but um, uh, any of them can be kind of hyped in a certain way and oversimplified. Um, the trial discourses also propagate a sense of automaticity suggesting the effects of clinic-based psychedelic administration follow a causative model typical of pharmaceutical explanation. Psychedelics are referred to as tools, inviting their mastery by clinicians and researchers. I have found stark discontinuities between the discrete, point-like, enduring changes reported by clinical research teams and experiences described to me by trial participants, guides and underground psychonauts for whom there is a trickstery labor in making sense of their experiences. The pharmacon may provide a useful concept here, famously articulated by Paracelsus in the toxicological sense of distinguishing poison and cure by dose. A contrasting interpretation is to understand these functions as coexisting, the properties of ambivalent substances. The psychedelic experiences of my ethnographic interlocutors have often followed the logic of the pharmacon, both solutions and new problems, generative riddles or koans. Knowledge of the ongoing containers that ex-trial participants build to successfully navigate new journeys initiated by psychedelic experiences are not prioritized by trial design and follow-ups that seek to assess more narrowly defined outcomes. I've also found that the role of the guides or therapists, which we've discussed a little today, has been far more complex and less automatizable than is often suggested in the contemporary clinical literature, including through the depiction of their function in peer-reviewed journal articles that demand short methodology sections. Many stories I've heard attest to crises that have been averted because of the care, intuition, and expertise of overground and underground guides both in acting and in not acting at the right times, both acutely and afterwards in the follow-up sessions. Medicalization should, not, should be understood as institutional too. During my time collaborating and conversing with psychedelic scientists over the past five years, there have been pressures for teams to shift targets they're interested in, such as from studying existential distress to major depressive disorder, because the latter and not the former is a legitimate disorder in accordance with the DSM-5 and the ICD-10, the predominant, uh, the pre preeminent psychiatric classificatory systems. Research is also shaped by the fetishization of the randomized control trial as the gold standard of evidence. Regulatory approval demands demonstrating only safety and efficacy in treatment using pre-selected outcome measures and this has sidelined other kinds of research questions and methods, such as qualitative research, research to explore so-called mechanisms of change in the clinical context, and research into the effects of controlling, not just for the drug, but for the context of the drug's administration. Histories of the pharmaceutical industry suggest a bad track record of medicalization when it comes to psychiatric problems, what a host of service user, psychiatric survivor, mad pride activists and critical psychiatrists have called problems in living. The psychiatric medicalization of depression has been a tale thus far of biochemical and individualizing responses to problems elsewhere understood in terms of systemic issues of disconnection, alienation and isolation which require collective interventions. And yet, <clears throat> it is tempting to give in to a culturally ingrained epochalism that this time is different. The history of psychiatry provides little comfort for this thought, yet progressivist stories of increased understanding, including increased targeting, are used to steal political zeal. The kinds of interventions Compass and the US-based MAPS organizations are hoping to offer 
those in need post-approval, a drug-assisted psychotherapies, novel for contemporary psychiatry. Medical historians, including Erica Dyke, argue the laboriousness and cost of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy were reasons why such therapy could not compete with the emerging treatment paradigms of the 1950s, which entailed outpatient services and the self-administered daily use of pharmaceutical drugs, increasingly since the 50s. Today's insistence by for-profit psychedelic, psychedelic pharmaceutical companies on the maintenance of safety and quality of service provision is at odds with the imperatives of profit maximization. Indeed, maximizing profits has required streamlining, simplifying, procuring exclusivity rights, secrecy, and the strategic representation of gifts and goals. Sorry, the strategic representation of goals and the use of gifts. Last year, a deep disappointment and anger swelled up in the psychedelics community against the activities of Compass and psychedelic for-profit enterprise in general. This was reflected in the statement on open science and open praxis with psilocybin, MDMA, and similar substances written by Bob Jesse, the convener of the Council on Spiritual Practices and a key figure in kickstarting psychedelics research in the 90s, followed by keen criticism from within the psychedelics community. Certainly until this point, antagonisms existed within the psychedelics community, made up itself of the overground research, but also underground psychonautic exploration and recreational use, and indigenous syncretic and neosyncretic traditions of using plant medicines. However, some argue that these groups were more symbiotic than parasitic, with the terms of recognition and coexistence continually contested and redrawn. Without wanting to paint a harmonious picture of these groups and their interactions, I think it's fair to say that with the ramping up of medicalization and the entry of large amounts of capital, a new phase of psychedelic medicine is coming into being. It is notable that what has been documented of Compass's practices are not unusual within the pharmaceutical industry, revealing a deep mismatch between the collaborative traditions woven through the contemporary psychedelics community and the culture of pharma. New fields attract those seeking not only profit, but ambition, status, acceptance. And this can lead to overbloated claims, such as the fetishizing, uh, fetishizing psychedelics as cures, incompetent uses of the medical model, and conflicts of interest. As an aside, I think we're seeing this at the moment with the drugs that have recently been approved for sexual desire disorder, um, which is being challenged by a kind of transnational network of feminist scholars. Several points of concern arise with the scaling up of psychedelic therapy. I'll briefly point towards three, and I hope this will key into some of our conversations from earlier. Firstly, on integration. This has been a catch-all term for an array of ways of understanding the work required to bring the meaning and the fruits of the psychedelic experience to bear upon one's life in the aftermath of the acute drug experience. In clinical trials, integration sessions begin soon after a psychedelic session, and the same conversations that begin there might continue well into the six-month and even one-year follow-ups, especially when there is a continuity in the clinical staff from the preparatory sessions right up to the end of the follow-up period. Since the resumption of clinical trials, a spate of community-based integration groups have sprung up across the US, and I know here too, although I know less about that. Um, and it's common at the sessions I've attended to meet ex-trial participants looking for more guidance and ways to extend and scaffold their psychedelic experiences. In underground and other modalities for producing psychedelic experiences such as holotropic breathwork, integration may take non-verbal forms, including through drawing, painting, and craft work. And we, we spoke a bit about that earlier. While the importance of integration continues to be paid lip service, the time it takes is costly and liable to be attenuated or even automated in for-profit contexts. Given also that the randomized control trial generated evidence fails to record much of the additional work of integration outside of and beyond the end of the trials themselves, this could be problematic in ways that we can currently only speculate. <coughs> 
we might take heed of how psychedelics as pharmaca can produce, on the one hand, new disappointments when they do not work, and on the other, new dissociations that need grounding. Intra uh, in terms of the first, introducing psychedelics into a culture that has long promised the targeted use of magic bullets will only heighten the disappointment when the experiences are not as straightforward as had been hoped for, especially for people for whom other treatments have failed. One interviewee during my research at Hopkins spoke of how the need to get it right and consequent feeling of being a failure for not having done so completely upended her first psilocybin session. On the other hand, a topic discussed in integration groups, a topic often discussed in integration groups is how coming down after a particularly strong psychedelic experience is less coming back than arriving somewhere else fresh with the experience of clarity, purity, and or simplicity, only to be thrust back into the intractable cruelties of mundanity and the everyday system and everyday systemic injustice, the rat race, social alienation, discrimination, and so on. In a for-profit system, a perverse incentive exists to ensure that further treatment is needed, capitalizing on the pharmacon-like properties of psychedelic experiences even while marketing the intervention is producing discrete, lasting, beneficial changes. Secondly, regulators require that the provision of new medications be scalable if they're to green light late stage clinical trials. Given the unmet need in the context of psychedelic medicalization is a massive prevalence of depression and PTSD in these cases, there needs to be a way to train hundreds if not thousands of psychedelic therapists quickly this is set to produce a whole new class of professionals claiming to know what uncredentialed others do not. The prospect of such a new hierarchy is regarded within the psychedelics movement that I have been in with irony amongst both those who extol the insights of anti-hierarchy gained from the psychedelic experience and long-standing and respected guides who are skeptical of such endeavors as only increasing transference the sense that patients do not know, but the guides, the system, the therapy does. The Canadian-Hungarian therapist Andrew Feldmar has described this kind of increase in transference as the opposite of emancipation, which is em from man, from the French, from bringing into your own hands. This professionalization goes hand in hand with psychedelic science claiming its jurisdiction over the spiritual, the mystical, and the transpersonal. Lastly, access is a huge issue. There are many questions about whether the provision of psychedelic therapy will provide access to marginalized groups. And on this, uh, Genesee Hertzberg has recently proposed understanding access in terms of reparations, that the communities most harmed by, the historic, by historic injustices are offered these potentially healing therapies. I think that's an interesting way of thinking about access. It's not clear to me whether and how phase three trials will avoid having the same explicit and implicit selection criteria as phases one and two. Together, these trials are prioritizing elite populations, generating path dependencies in the form of standardized protocols and procedures based upon the typical participant to date, white, educated, middle-class subject who can afford to take the time off work for all the meetings and the paperwork. As an aside, in the US, the research has largely been funded privately, as it doesn't have to meet the uh, National Institute of Health's Revitalization Act, which stipulates that the, some, the, the, the population or the, the, the clinical trial participants need to mirror, in some sense, the demographics of the populations to whom the eventual intervention is targeted. The usual response has been that finally reaching these advanced stage trials marks a time to demonstrate efficacy and no new safety concerns and not the time to be tinkering with the procedures and protocols of the trials. In this way, medicalization insists on what Reinberger has described as the testing of what is already known and not the exploratory experimentation of what we do not know. And yet, the knowledge generated may consequently only apply to a privileged minority, uh, majority, 
or minority, depending on whether you think the term in terms of number or power. And down the road, use in alternative ways will come to count as misuse, feeding litigation, moralism, and the further medicalization of subpopulations, something we'll come back to. Recently, MAPS attempted to prioritize the enrollment of a non-normative population, those affected by race-based trauma, in one of its phase three sites. And Monica Williams has since listed the myriad barriers to success that were experienced before the site closed. So far, I've tried to sketch out ways in which medicalization presents challenges, including ways that the very attempt to medicalize may change that which it is medicalizing, which may be a problem for those who call for medicalization at any cost. These are some dangers of putting all eggs in the medicalization basket. There is a second way of approaching the challenge that brings us together, which is to recognize that psilocybin already is a medicine. Properly speaking, we're here to discuss making psilocybin into a medication, and from this vantage point, any willful slippage is telling. It may then be that we need to ask different questions altogether. Anthropological, ethnobotanical, and archaeological data suggest psilocybin mushrooms and other psychedelic substances have been used for thousands of years. In Western countries today, their use is widespread, across underground, indigenous, and sacramental contexts. Alongside the recreational use of psychedelics, the underground includes therapeutic use, rigorous and exploratory scientific inquiry, community-based harm reduction activities, and the building of a diverse array of containers for holding and integrating psychedelic experiences, including many of the integration groups I referred to earlier. But for the non-sanctioned use of psychedelic medicines, Criminalization itself produces harms. Harm reduction has thus been a central and successful strategy, including making drug testing available, disseminating information on growing, storing, extracting, and propagating psychedelic substances, educating police, and developing safe spaces. In underground therapy sites I've been privy to, access takes on a very different form, moving more often at the speed of trust scaling up through personal referral rather than standardization and replication. Legalizing drugs and focusing on harm reduction would for organizations like Release Here and the Drug Policy Alliance in the US be big stepping stones to ending the war on drugs, which has been the centerpiece for racist policing, mass incarceration, and international militarism. Some in the psychedelics community have dismissed calls for the legalization of psychedelics considering it wishful thinking or fearing the return of snake oil peddlers. But le legalization already exists on a wide spectrum. Caffeine, alcohol, and prescription drugs are regulated in very different ways. Models of regulation would need to depend, would need to be different depending on the uses and potential harms of the drug. Meanwhile, Portugal and the Czech Republic offer examples of across the board drug decriminalization with respected scientists and advocates highlighting the absurdity of current drug laws, concerns about the size of the prison industry, and greater sympathy for drug addiction as a public health and not a criminal justice issue, public support for decriminalization appears high enough to warrant considering it a politically expedient <coughs> goal. Yet against the radical options of decriminalizing or legalizing and regulating all drugs along the lines proposed by release, stands a salient and perhaps growing psychedelic exceptionalism. The claim is that psychedelics, and perhaps marijuana as well nowadays, are different than other drugs, or that they are not drugs at all, and that psychedelics users are not like other drug users. This despite the fact that, the psych that psychedelics are commonly used alongside other illegal drugs, drugs which are perceived to be used in, much, in, in more racially stratified ways than they in fact are. This leads us to slightly different questions. Advocacy towards decriminalization and legalization is about increasing safe access to healing, health, and well-being for all, commitments that I think many of us share. Will the availability of psychedelic medication help or hinder efforts towards more broad decriminalization and legalization of psychedelic therapy? 
And how will committing to and working in the name of medicalization, whether over five or 10 years, reshape the movements towards decriminalization and legalization? So I'll end with three thoughts towards this. Firstly, medicalization is sure to change public perception, but perception of whom? Marijuana medicalization in the US certainly changed perceptions of who uses marijuana. Increasingly, we might imagine the kindly old white grandmother but didn't lead to any change in criminal justice policy. And after marijuana medicalization, arrests in California remained high and disproportionate all the way until full legalization in 2016. Will a young person of color taking psilocybin or MDMA at a rave or festival be any safer if psychedelic therapy is available elsewhere? While medicalization may trouble some of the myths about these drugs, like that they are not inherently dangerous, the import of challenging the myths lies not, or not only, in rescuing the reputation of the drugs, but in challenging the racism, classism, and sexism against those demonized along with them. Secondly, in providing a framework for access and use, by definition, medicalization creates the conditions for abuse. The clinical trials are producing findings with no wider ecological validity beyond one highly demarcated use of uh, good manufacturing practice grade psilocybin in the case of Compass and MDMA in the case of MAPS. How could anything other than the setup designed around the combination of drug set setting get rescheduled? Indeed, this is all the regulators and policymakers can do if they're basing their decisions on the scientific evidence. But then the position adopted by a range of influential psychedelic scientists of not condoning the unsupervised use of psychedelics can take on a new significance, cleaving medicalized, sanitized, purified treatments from a vast ecology of social and cultural uses of plant medicines and synthetic drugs. Psychedelic drug use outside the clinic is positioned as dangerous or irresponsible in order to defend clinical use against the same charge. A public division is able to ferment between the good psychedelics user and the bad psychedelics abuser. Returning once more to the centrality of set and setting in the shaping of a drug experience, to suggest that non-clinical use of psychedelics is dangerous may be self-fulfilling, producing more anxious or paranoid mindsets and morally punitive cultural settings for their use. The exceptionalism tightens, even when at the same time research scientists draw on epidemiological data about naturalistic use that would seem to contradict the claim that only lab-based experiences are safe. Lastly, ex examples suggest that with the arrival of access for the relatively powerful and privileged, decriminalization for others is deprioritized. It may be useful to recall that after the advent of medical marijuana, some of the most vocal opposition to outright legalization in the 2016 ballot initiative in California came from the large marijuana corporations, alongside some patient groups, which is another lobby commonly found in the pharmaceutical industry. Once a protected class of drug users is institutionalized, an array of interests seek to protect that class, especially if financial profit or self-legitimation is at stake. In another example, the prescription drugs Adderall and Ritalin, um, almost interchangeable with the illegal drug methamphetamine, um, are, are almost interchangeable with the illegal drug methamphetamine, yet amongst those with access to prescriptions, there's little interest in the injustices faced by those using the near same chemicals illegally. So it may be claimed that we can and should do both medicalize and decriminalize. A good example of this might be the harm reduction work done by MAPS's Zendo project. Through Zendo, MAPS's founder, Rick Doblin, has argued the importance of showing the public that the psychedelics community can address the harms of psychedelics effectively. I want to end with a note of caution concerning the call for both and. Medicalization can occur in many ways, ranging from faster and more profit-driven to slower and more participatory from embedding a right way to use psychedelics to ensuring regulators and the public more deeply engage the plurality of safe ways of using psychedelics. 
Moreover, as I've sought to show, the forces of medicalization shaped the science, which shapes public understandings of what is right or wrong, good or bad. But in any such scenario, it seems inevitable that venture capital-backed efforts at medicalization will dominate the field, as they currently are, and as Big Pharma has done regarding previous treatments for depression, at the cost of securing more just drug policy and criminal justice reform, alongside more open-ended inquiry into psychedelics and the containers that are built around them. Moreover, scaling psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy for depression is an opportunity again to ask collective questions about the increasing prevalence of depression in our societies instead of medicalizing and treating individuals. We might seek the pursuit of meaningful social connection, the embrace of difference, community spaces, non-precarious employment and affordable housing. Such challenges, perhaps, are being relegated to a 1960s countercultural politics of psychedelics, where the psychedelic experience enables the revisioning of existing paradigms. Instead of psychedelicizing pharma, the pharmaceuticalizing of psychedelics hopes to harness the transformative power of psychedelics one individual at a time. And in so doing, medicalization becomes a kind of social pharmacon. In promising to make psychedelic experiences more available, it reduces what one could call the plasticity of these experiences and how they are held, even in the hope that once medicalized, a thousand flowers may bloom once again. But lessons from the history of the pharmaceutical industry, alongside the ongoing harms of the war on drugs, advocate for caution, if not outright skepticism. I hope this talk has been useful to unpack some of these issues. Big Pharma, it seems, needs psychedelic medicine, but I'm left wondering, does psychedelic medicine need Big Pharma? Thanks. <laughs> that, was, that was fascinating, thank you. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, so I thought perhaps if you're okay, then you and Henry both come up and we can field some questions. surgery treating obesity, we're left with people who are really, really, really unwell, have been unwell for a long time, and we're trying to get them better. And, and throughout history, psychedelics have been used in rites of passage um, uh, in order to you know, kind of celebrate a certain transition in the, in the life period. And I'm wondering what you think the um, prophylactic use of psychedelics is before someone develops treatment-resistant depression before someone's been depressed for a long time and develops an addiction. Could these substances have a role in um, keeping people well rather than treating them once they become unwell? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. yeah. Um, right, uh, the prophylactic. Uh, psychedelics prophylactics. Well, I mean, in my experience, um, I can totally understand how they could be prophylactic. Um, uh, the ways in which people uh, that I've encountered have changed after powerful psychedelic experiences, including as induced in the lab context, like the trial participants that I interviewed uh, in the smoking cessation trial. Um, I can well understand that both having to, in a sort of therapeutic way, engage quite deeply and powerfully with what has led you to the point of having psychedelic medicine um, in some form or another, uh, and then engaging with the uh, trials and challenges or whatever of the psychedelic experience itself and the sort of fallout from that. 
I can well understand uh, it having a kind of prophylactic effect on future adverse experiences. Um, I suppose part of my talk was to point out that there's a kind of pharmacon aspect, as, as, I'm, as I've been using the term to describe it, with psychedelics, where they can also have negative onward effects. Um, I think to the extent that you don't see that in the clinical trials, a lot of that is to do with set and setting. A lot of that is to do with um, the degree of privilege or the sort of uh, ability to build containers for themselves and support themselves after the experience that a lot of the trial participants have. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but I've also and I've also encountered people who have been pretty unspun after their psychedelic experiences, including in a lab context, and have then sought to try and make sense of them, including building kind of new containers for both producing similar kinds of experiences and um, just working on what has come out of their experiences to date. So, it's a kind of it's a lot a lot in there. But. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose the the interesting point from a kind of regulatory point of view, or how you, how you would deal with that, is it, it very much blurs the line between medical uh, regulation and non-medical regulation when you're talking about using it in a prophylactic setting, because in some kind of wellness retreat or whatever it might be, how, how do you actually, you know, does it, do you undergo medical trials to prove that it's, uh, or clinical trials to prove that it can be useful in a prophylactic setting, or do you allow non-medical regulation to take that path and so make it available that way. It's, it's, it, yeah, that's where the challenge is. I think how on earth do you regulate for it? Okay. But, then, but then I mean the sort of widespread use of neurotropics or, or stuff to do with kind of the betterment of well people, to use that term that is kind of cautiously used within the psychedelics world. Um, I can see those as very much sort of expanding markets that, um, that would have their own regulation and that could be medical in their own way, perhaps it would be more up to uh, other people in the room to decide whether that's the remit proper of psychiatry or not. One would think not, but perhaps that is somewhere where we're going. Um, I don't know, and I'd actually be very curious to learn more about where the notions of spiritual malaise in whatever form are gaining some kind of greater visibility within psychiatric um, kind of uh, thinking broadly. Any other questions? Uh, during the sort of uh, journey of uh, cannabis uh, legalization for medical purposes, there were some critics who leveled the claim that um, it was being used as a backdoor to allow wider legalization. Is there an inherent conflict between the concept of uh, legalizing drugs from a, a harm reduction perspective and legalization for medical purposes? Um, I think it, it fundamentally, so those arguments get leveled against uh, medical cannabis legalization and there's a whole host of different models of medical cannabis legalization now taking place across the world. Certainly in, in, the, in the US, I think there's a valid argument to say that, that a lot of medical cannabis leg legislation that was brought in was at least to some extent, uh, yeah, Trojan horse for, for broader regulation. Uh, in Europe, they've been far more conscious that when they've brought in medical cannabis regulation, it's been very tightly regulated uh, because they don't want it to bleed into uh, non-medical regulation. Um, I, I mean, t in terms of if there's a kind of conflict between two, I mean, my, my personal view is you can't actually have an effective medical system for something as widely available as cannabis if you're not actually regulating non-medical use as well in some way, because if people can just source it for non-medical use, uh, it, or if, if the only option for people to source it uh, for non-medical use is illegal, there will inevitably be some people who want to use it for medical use, sourcing it through those routes illegally anyway, so you need to address both. Uh, and, and then you can actually ring fence medical use more effectively as well. So I think we might, we might break for break for tea. Um, and ruminate for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, then we'll be hearing from Ekaterina Maliovskaya, who's the co-founders of the Compass. <laughs>
that will then lead into a closing plenary discussion um, surrounding all these different issues. So more to come um, back in 15 minutes. Thanks. Thank you.